Welcome to all. Um, this virtual worship service is coming to you from First Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York on this April 26th, 2020. It is the third Sunday of Easter. Let us give thanks for our baptisms. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of our baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the good shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side. And on this day, you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you 
for your salvation through water, for the water in the font, and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the life only you can give. To you be honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray the prayer of the day. O oh God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of our faith, that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts, chapter 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Here ends the first reading. We will now read responsively from Psalm 116. I love the Lord, who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I called. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay you, the Lord, for all the good things God has done for me? I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servant. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, Alleluia. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, Live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day, when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. 
But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we were talking on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they took what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Welcome to worship at First Lutheran Church on this third Sunday of Easter, the 26th of April, 2020. Let us pray. O oh God, we don't know what lies ahead. Therefore, journey with us so that we may draw strength from your word and comfort from your presence with us until the end. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, where do you go? when your life has been turned upside down? What do you do when every norm seems to have been turned inside out? How do you find your anchor when it feels like God is very distant from your immediate situation in life, or even worse yet, when it feels like God isn't even there anymore? That Easter just was some kind of unreliable mirage in the desert. If COVID-19 isn't an example of how our lives have been turned upside down, inside out, or made us feel as though the line to our anchor has been severed, leaving us adrift, then I'm not sure what would be. We're beginning week seven since we received Bishop Paul's guidance to close the doors of our in-person worship services at First Lutheran back in, on March 15th. And I've noticed as I watched last Sunday's virtual service that all of our lectors and worship assistants and your pastor need haircuts. Now, Lisa ordered clippers to give her dog a trim, and I knew I was in psychological trouble when I felt jealous of the dog. But this really is no laughing matter. 
In a Zoom quarantini session I had last week with old colleagues and friends, the reflection soon moved from the absurd, like wishing I was Lisa's dog, to serious concerns about the effects of psychological isolation and the fact that there really is no end in sight. Despite some early signs of hope as the death statistics have leveled out in some places across the globe, experts at the CDC have been warning that the next wave may be even more devastating than the first. Families sheltering in place are struggling as they try to share limited computer access for studies, for work, or worse than that, try to figure out how to put food on the table or pay the rent or mortgage without any idea whatsoever when the next paycheck may be coming or not at all. If ever there was a great divide between the haves and the have-nots, that's become more evident because of COVID-19 over the course of the past seven weeks. I'm hearing from people who have loved ones who are ill or dying with no way possible to be present to them other than through prayer. There are elders languishing in isolation week after week, caregiver children or spouses who ache to be with them but do not dare risk infecting them. Separation from our loved ones, young and in love or old and in love, trapped in the conundrum of not knowing whether to risk reunions or wait it out indefinitely, all takes a toll as the days turn to weeks and now the weeks are turning to months. And against the backdrop of these more manageable dilemmas, the real and life and death struggles go on. Medical personnel and first responders literally laying their lives on the line as they go about their daily work under unimaginable conditions, ill-equipped in some cases, and emotionally and physically exhausted in most cases. Thank God, all across the globe, people are recognizing that sacrifice, maybe for the first time in some cases, and making noise and celebrating at the beginning and ends of shifts. The layers and layers of angst and disappointment and the heaviness of not having any idea, really, about what's coming next has become the new norm. For those of us living here in the epicenter of this virus in this country, but for others who have not experienced the coronavirus up close and personally, their impatience with the lockdowns has begun to erupt in angry protests. And so the great divide continues to deepen in this country. So where do you go when your life has been turned upside down? What do you do when every norm seems to have been turned inside out? Well, our gospel lesson for today begins with a very poignant scene. Two friends who knew Jesus and had such hope for him, who believed that he was the one, he was the one to redeem Israel, the long-awaited Savior, Messiah. And now all their hopes are dashed. They can no longer bear that atmosphere of despair in Jerusalem. And so these two friends have left the community of Jesus' confused disciples behind them and are making their way towards a village called Emmaus, which was about a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem. Now, perhaps it was their home village. We don't really know. But I think we can identify, in any case, with their anxiety and their uncertainty about what the future would bring. If there was any place you and I could run away to and return to the old normal, I think most of us would be heading there post haste. This invisible enemy out there is hard to fight. We don't know what to believe, what to think, what to expect, or even what we can reasonably hope for. In this, we are probably feeling very, very much like those two followers of Jesus were feeling as they journeyed away from Jerusalem and headed toward Emmaus. We're on a journey too, and we don't even know what the destination will be. The writer of Luke's Gospel sets his entire account of the life and ministry and mission and suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus in the context of a journey. 
Jesus' journey begins along the Sea of Galilee and moves towards Jerusalem, the cross, death, resurrection, and ascension. The writer of St. Luke's Gospel also describes the story of the early Christian community as a journey which begins in Jerusalem and eventually, as we learn in the book of Acts, the successor to, to Luke, reaches out to the ends of the earth. In fact, the disciples in the early church community are frequently even referred to as the people of the journey. Perhaps this is why we often refer to the process of the deepening of our faith through the lived experiences of our lives as our faith journeys. We might even notice how often in Scripture Jesus meets his followers as they are moving forward in faith, taking risks on the move. So it is really no surprise that in the pivotal story in the Gospel of Luke, the context is a journey. The two friends on the road to Emmaus are involved in an intense discussion along the way, analyzing all that has happened, trying to make sense of it, but soon they realize that they can really not make any sense of it, not, not on their own. And just then, as the journey continues forward, Jesus himself came near and went with them, as Luke 24 puts it. At first, I don't realize that this stranger is Jesus. And as they walk on together and relive the recent events in Jerusalem, it is in fact Jesus who helps them make the connections, connecting the dots, recounting for them the whole sweep of salvation history, interpreting for them the meaning of all the journeying of the people of Israel. Jesus is the one who explains the prophecies and how they've been fulfilled in the journey of Jesus himself from Galilee to Jerusalem, from the grave to the resurrection. But notice too, that it is not until the two friends invite the stranger to stay with them and to join them in their evening meal that they actually recognize Jesus. We read in Luke's Gospel that it is in the blessing of the bread as Jesus broke it and gave it to them that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. We immediately recall Jesus' words and his actions at the feeding of the multitudes earlier in Luke, Luke 9, and as we are reminded of Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper in the context of that last Passover meal that he shared with his disciples on the day we now traditionally mark as Monday Thursday. As soon as these two traveling companions recognize Jesus, Jesus vanishes. And with their hearts burning within them, the two friends immediately get up and they return to Jerusalem. They return to their community, to the 11 disciples and their companions who are gathered together. I wonder if you noticed the pattern in this story. It goes like this. The two travelers are met on the road, have the scriptures explained to them, share in a meal that reveals the identity and presence of Christ, and are sent to share and live out the good news of the risen Christ. I wonder if you noticed in this pattern the classic sequence of Christian worship. We gather together in the presence of God. We hear the word of God in scripture. We receive Christ in, with, and under the elements of Holy Communion. And then, then we're sent to do the work of God which is to love God and our neighbors. So where do you go when your life has been turned upside down? One of the great joys of this story is a reminder that in Christian worship, we will encounter the risen Christ. This is the one who knows all our sorrows, all our disappointments, all our needs, and comes to us. Jesus listens to the two travelers on the road struggling to make sense of all that has happened, and as they invite him to stay longer with them, they come to recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. They receive hope and the joy of new life 
through their relationships with Jesus. When we come together, we are reminded that we are not alone. We have each other, the body of Christ. Perhaps that is what makes our mandated social distancing so excruciatingly painful as the days of our physical separation have dragged on and on with no end in sight. We are missing the short, long journeys from our pews at First Lutheran up the aisle to the communion rail each Sunday when we gather together to receive in the elements of Holy Communion, the bread and the wine, the very real presence of Christ to strengthen and empower us to continue this particularly challenging segment of our journey of faith and life. But friends, the good news for today is that God is still with us. Scripture reminds us over and over again that God is good and generous and can be counted on in every age and every circumstance, and even this one, that God's steadfast love never ceases. So as we continue this unwanted journey with COVID-19 every day, if we're paying attention, there are new stories emerging to show us how God is still with us along our way. We may not be able to break bread together, but many of us are sharing a glass of wine with each other during spirit-sustaining quarantini sessions on Zoom or as we do our Zoom fellowship breakfasts or our Zoom pub nights at First Lutheran, we see each other, we laugh with each other, we hear and read in the newspapers too about how medical advances and, and data are being shared globally towards the goal of developing an effective vaccination, how neighbors are caring for neighbors they never even bothered to meet before, how all kinds of people in all kinds of circumstances are finding creative ways to nurture community and friendship across these enforced social distancing rules. Our hearts are being opened in new ways to frontline workers in hospitals, first responders, those who take away our refuse and stock our supermarket shelves. We have realized recently that those who attend virtual worship with us at First Lutheran are more than double the number of those who have traditionally populated our pews on a Sunday morning. And on Easter Sunday, Rosemary reports 473 people worshiped with us for our joint virtual service with St. John's Lutheran. That's something to celebrate. People are drawn to the divine, the sacred, the holy, and to community. They are dying for want of grace and wonder and mystery, and not for want of bylaws and, and committees and sign-up sheets and, and, and strategic planning. The crowds in our first reading today from Acts, after hearing Peter's impassioned sermon, ask this question, what should we do? And the answer comes to us in our second reading from 1 Peter 1, verse 22. And that answer is this, love one another deeply from the heart. Where do you go when your life has been turned upside down? What do you do when every norm seems to have been turned inside out? You size up the situation as it is, and you figure out how best to love one another deeply from the heart. And when you do this, when you break open your fears and reinvest them in the needs of those around you, when in the midst of the new normal that sorely tries your patience and plays games with your psyche, and truly strive to love one another deeply from the heart. That is where Jesus will join you on the journey, your faith journey, and reveal himself to you. That is where you will find God's peace in the midst of the COVID chaos all around us. Amen.
Together, let us affirm our faith using the words that come from the Moravian Affirmation. We believe in the one God who has created the land and seas and heavens and all that is in them, who established a world that is good, who gives to us the task of watchful and responsible care over it, who is certainty and truth. We believe in the one God who in Jesus Christ assumed our humanity and knew our life as a child, youth, and adult, who dined with sinners and lived with the homeless, who confronted popular opinion and power, who remained obedient in temptation and suffering, whose triumph was a servant's death and resurrection. We believe in the one God who comes to us as comforter and advocate, who does not leave us as orphans, who brings peace and calms the troubled heart, who bestows gifts for serving, healing, showing compassion and doing miracles, who alone is the power and the wisdom of our proclamation. Amen. Prayers of Intercession Uplifted by the promise, hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. For those whose hearts are fervent with love for your gospel, that they are empowered to tell the story of your love in their lives and to show hospitality in response to this love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the diverse natural world, for jungles, prairies, forests, valleys, mountains, and for all the wild and endangered animals who call these spaces home, that they are nurtured and protected, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For broken systems we have inherited and that we continue to perpetuate, forgive us. Restrain the nations from fighting over limited resources. Redeem us from the cycles of scarcity and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who call upon your healing name, give rest. Stay with us and walk with all those who are hungry, friendless, despairing, and desiring healing in spirit. We especially remember all who are struggling with being quarantined, especially those who are trapped in homes or shelters where they do not feel safe or cared for. We pray for children as they try to make sense of this anxious time and for all who aren't sure how they will pay their bills or put food on the table for their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who are suffering from the virus, we pray for healing and strength. Bless the doctors, nurses, and health care professionals who care for them. Bless the hospital staff that clean and disinfect the rooms. Bless all first responders who are still working to keep everyone safe. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for Maria and for John as Maria recovers from an unanticipated surgical procedure this past week at Memorial Sloan Kettering and continues with her treatments. For Laura, Peter's daughter, and her neighbors and friends as she and her family are in the midst of recovering from the tornado which devastated their community and braces for more. For Pastor Marv Hank and his loved ones and Marv Hank was the pastor of Lisa as he battles the coronavirus and recovers from a clot in the lungs associated with that battle. Our prayers continue for the Trivedi family in India, family uh, of Carol's and Susan's. For Nancy, Donna, Erica, Henry, Laura, and Ryan, among our immediate and extended church families who serve selflessly in medical settings. And we pray for the many others now known to us, and unknown to us who are also ill with the virus. Our prayers are with Kurt's mother, Carol, 
with Anne Constantinople's niece, for Maureen and Frank, for Taryn and Chris, for Tom and Phil, as they all continue with treatments or with caregiving. We pray also for Ricky's sisters, for Lisa's sister, for Scott's sister, for Peter's grandson, Owen, and for Angela's mother, Joan. We continue to pray for Eddie, for Richard and David, for Dave, Dave and Dale, for Owen, for Arnold, each according to their needs. And we also remember in our prayers today, Tan Su, Hans, Eunice, Louise, Jean, Alice, Judy, and Eleanor. Our prayers continue for the safety of Dylan and his unit in Afghanistan, for all members of our military, wherever they serve, and for their families and loved ones, and for the chaplains who minister to them, including Anthony Stevens, husband of Lisa. And we pray for our Bishop Paul, assistant to the Bishop Chris, for our presiding Bishop Elizabeth, for St. John's Lutheran, for the Lutheran Care Center, Dutchess County Interfaith Council, our ecumenical partners, including the World Council of Churches, and for the Church Universal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the ecumenical prayer cycle for today, our sisters and brothers in Christ in Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan have all asked us to join them in praying for the people in these lands who suffer from poverty and repressive rule, for an end to clashes related to tribalism, traditionalism, and modernization, for the land, air, and water that have been damaged by human abuse, for good relations between Muslims and Christians, for an end to oppression and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Create in our hearts a yearning to rest in your promise of eternal and resurrected life. Comfort all who are grieving and help us to have thankful hearts for the witness of those who have died, even as we look forward to the hope of new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us take a few moments to share the peace. If you are, if you are sheltering in place with others, uh, please greet them and uh, remember the rest of us as you are sharing the peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Amen. Let us pray. O God, of, o God of justice and love, we give thanks that you illumine our way through life with your word. Give us the light we need, awake us to the needs of others, and at last bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Now as our Savior has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thou will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, and power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Join me. Alleluia. 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 Amen.